Well, my dear friends, tonight's story scared the living hell out of me. It's one of those that really taps into those primal childhood fears that so many of us have. I can't wait for you to listen to this one. I really can't. And, well, you know what? It gets even better because tonight's author, Chica de Luna, is offering you a free copy of his book. All you have to do is head over to his website and sign up and you'll get a free copy of Black Eyes. Absolutely well worth it, I tell you. Now, my dear friends, it's Friday. We've made it to the weekend. So, you know what to do. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink because it's time to listen. I remember the day I got lost at the mall. I was only six at the time, and I'm 36 now, with a wife and three kids. (laughs) You'd think I would have forgotten all about that childhood incident. But some things scar you for life. Doesn't matter how old you grow, or how many responsibilities you heap on your shoulders. The nightmares you experience in childhood are the ones that affect you the most. Because you'll never forget how small and insignificant they made you feel at the time. I've never been back to a mall, not since I was six, and I won't let my kids so much as set foot in one. My wife, May, well, she's used to my eccentricities by now, but in the beginning she couldn't figure it out, and it seemed at times we were doomed to break up on that issue alone. So one day, just for the sake of our relationship, I sat her down and told her about that long ago day, when I was six years old, and I got lost at the mall. I hated the cinema. I'll tell you that right off the bat. I hated the entire mall, but I hated the cinema most of all. It sat right on the topmost level. It was the smallest of the mall's five levels, and there was just enough room for a fast food place on one side of the escalator and the cinema on the other. That was it. If you look through the railings on the fifth level, you could see the other levels below. You could see all the way down to the ground floor of the mall. It was like a thousand foot drop to my six-year-old eyes. I imagined if someone took a tumble over those railings, they'd fall for at least a week. The mall was as big as a city block as far as I was concerned. And there were so many people filling it. Maybe millions, maybe more. And they were all rushing about making a weird buzzing sound that only translated into actual words when they passed really close to me. Sometimes people smiled at me, but mostly everyone just looked hot and bothered, and if they had kids with them, those kids were likely to look hot and bothered too. I hated them all. I hated the hustle and bustle. It scared me. I was scared to death I'd become separated from my mother, and then I'd have to find a mall cop to help me find her. Mum told me I wasn't to talk to anyone else, no matter how friendly they looked. I wondered why I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone else. Were they dangerous? Would they kidnap me? Was everyone in the whole world a kidnapper? No, everyone except mall cops. Mall cops would help me find my mummy again. All this advice gave them all an extra dimension of threat. I developed an unhealthy paranoia as I clutched Mom's hand and peered fretfully around at all the strangers rushing past. Mom's hand was a lifeline in a raging sea of potential kidnappers. One wrong move and I'd be snatched up and carried off, never to be seen again. Mom was pretty relentless about her shopping. She surged along, dragging me behind her, and people made way for her without really thinking about it. She had a formidable presence, a rolling momentum, a consumer chi that she built up all week long and then released in a sudden blind splurge every Saturday afternoon when she hit the mall. Our shopping all done, we would inevitably end up at the topmost level, eating fries and greasy burgers opposite the movie theater. And, much as I enjoyed the fast food, I couldn't tear my eyes away from the cavernous entrance to that cinema. It was sinister. There were these huge glass doors that always stood open, but you couldn't see too far beyond them. Everything was dark and red-tinged, and there was the suggestion of a kiosk way back in the darkness, but you couldn't really make it out. 
and just outside the entrance there were all these posters advertising movies I was too young to see. I used to sit munching on my fries and staring at the cinema, not daring to take my eyes off it because I was convinced there were all manners of ghosts and bogeymen lurking in the dark cavity beyond its doors, watching me waiting for that single moment when I grew careless and glanced away, and then they'd have me. By God, they could move in a twinkling. They could move in a blink of an eye, grabbing me out of my seat and hauling me off to the cinema before I could draw a breath to scream. Mom wouldn't notice I was gone, not until she'd finished the chapter in the romance novel she was currently reading. By then, it would be too late. I would have been swallowed up by whatever monster festered in the bowels of that movie theatre. I hardly ever saw anyone come out of that cinema, or go into it. The people who made it to the summit of the mall were more interested in the food than entertainment, and the burger place was always busy. But the cinema was always silent, and hungry, and resentful, watching me with its red-tinged mouth stretched wide, and whispering to me, Hey, Jeremy, come on over here, little man. Come and see the grown-up films. Come and see all the good stuff. Your mom won't notice you're gone. You'll be back before she misses you. Come on over, Jeremy. Come and see all the stuff they won't let you see at home. I wasn't tempted for a second. I knew that voice. It was the same voice that came creeping out of my closet when I was alone at night, or whispered to me from under the bed. Every six-year-old knows that voice. But unlike other six-year-olds, I knew where the bogeyman really lived. I'd found his eternal nest, and it was the cinema at the very top of the mall. I dreaded that place. I had nightmares about that place. I was an only child, and Mum pretty much had no choice but to take me to the mall with her. But I used to kick up such a fuss, I used to cry and throw tantrums and plead with her not to take me until, eventually, she'd bribe me with a promise to buy something nice from the toy shop if I was a good little soldier, and gave her my word I'd behave. So, I gave her my word, because in a kid's mind a brand new toy outweighs all manner of evil, and I went along with her, and I was a good little soldier, and so she'd reward me by buying me a toy. And that's the way it went. Until one day, everything changed. Mum was particularly flustered that day. She'd had a row with Dad earlier in the day, and he'd slashed her shopping budget, as I'd later learn. So she was particularly crabby. No hint of, Jeremy, be a good boy and I'll buy you a toy. No, it was basically, Jeremy... You behave, or I'll give you the hiding of your life. She was wearing a blue nail varnish. Somehow I'd worked it out in my head that Mum's moods corresponded to the colour of the nail varnish she wore. Red was when she was at her most generous. Green meant she was in a hyper-busy mood and had no time for nonsense. Blue meant she was mad as hell, and you better watch out. Today was a blue nail varnish day. We were on a whirlwind tour of the shops, working our way up to the topmost level like we usually did. I was scuttling after Mum, my short legs trying to keep pace with her. She wasn't holding my hand today. She was grasping too many bags and trying to steer her shopping cart at the same time, so I was pretty much expected to keep up with her. I did a good job of it, until we reached the third level. That was the level with the toy shop. I knew Mum was in a bad mood, so I didn't dare ask her if she was going to buy me a toy. But when she swept past the toy shop on the way to the supermarket, she showed no signs of slowing down. I couldn't help feeling a pang of deep longing, my head twisting around on my shoulders, my eyes invariably drawn to the shop, my feet slowing and faltering. Oh my god... They had the new Transformer figures in the display windows, lined up like artifacts from another dimension. All the Autobots were there. Optimus Prime, Sideswipe, Sunstreaker, Hound, Prowl, Mirage, Wheeljack, Ratchet. 
Ironhide, oh, Bumblebee, Brawn, Huffer, Cliff Jumper, Blue Streak. I was overwhelmed by this sudden avalanche of stimulus. My six year old brain in slow, orgiastic meltdown. I glanced back briefly at Mom. She was heading straight into the supermarket. I knew where she was. I could catch up with her any time I liked. All I wanted to do was stand in front of that display window and bask in the glory that was the Hasbro 1985 Transformer toy line. I mean, there were practically two toys in one. I stared myself dizzy, absorbing every detail of those toys. My face squashed up against the window so hard I practically turned my nose inside out. And still I couldn't get enough. I wanted to touch them and stroke them and coo over them. If only I could somehow reach through that glass and pick one up. Just hold it for a second. I swore I'd work in a toy shop when I grew up. There'd never again be a barrier between me and my favourite toys. I could play with them all day long. And the shop would even let me take them home at night. It was a perfect job. Right up there with sweet shop owner. Hey, Jeremy. You want to come play with us? I looked around. I straight away noticed this kid. He was standing close to me, smiling in a friendly enough kind of way. He had tussled brown hair and he was a little taller than me. He was wearing an Empire Strikes Back t-shirt. The kind of promotional t-shirt you could get in the foyer of any cinema when the movie was out a few years prior. You want to play? He inquired again. I shook my head. I'm with my mum. I said. Ah, oh, that's too bad, said the kid as he wiped his sleeve across his nose. We got all the new Transformer toys. We got them before they even came out in the shops. My friend's dad works in that place that makes the toys, so he gets all the latest stuff. I was instantly entranced. Oh, which ones have you got? I asked. All of them. Autobots, Decepticons, Dinobots... We even got Gobots. Yeah, Gobots are kind of crappy, I said. The kid laughed. <laughs> yeah, he said. We hardly ever play with them. You want to come see which ones we got? I grew doubtful again. I turned to look in the direction of the supermarket into which Mum had vanished. As if reading my mind, the kid said, Come on, we'll be back before your mum knows you're gone. I frowned. The kid gave me this look, like I was a scaredy cat or something. You want to see the toys, right? He demanded. I nodded. So, come on. I drifted after him. I was in a daze. All I could think of were these Transformer toys. The kid said he had them all, even Dinobots, which were pretty hard to come by around our way. And I was hooked on that promise. I kept telling myself I'd be super quick. Just one peek at this kid's toys. And then I'd be back at mum's side and she wouldn't even know I'd been gone. <laughs> it was a perfect plan as far as my six-year-old mind was concerned. It never occurred to me to ask where the kid kept all his toys. I naturally assumed he lived in the mall with his folks. I'd come to that conclusion long ago. <laughs> People actually lived in the mall and did their shopping there every day. And all the staff lived in those little houses hidden behind the shops they worked in. And that's why they always disappeared through back doors that no one else was allowed to go through. Mm. I felt pretty honoured this kid was letting me see where he lived. I'd secretly been aching to see one of those little mall houses I knew were hidden everywhere. He kept chatting to me about the various toys he had. He chatted really fast and he was really funny. He made me smile a lot. He had an easy way about him, I guess you could say. But still, at the back of my mind, I got this nagging feeling something just wasn't right. Where are your parents? I asked the kid. Do you live with them? No. <laughs> no. He laughed, as though that should have been obvious. I'm a mall kid. I was intrigued by that phrase. What's a mall kid? I asked. 
He shrugged. We're everywhere, he said. All the places grown-ups don't care to look. He swept his arm around to suggest I should go ahead and take a look for myself. I glanced around, wondering what he was on about, and at first I saw nothing, just people dashing about the way they always did. But slowly, inexorably, I saw them, like mirages appearing out of the sweltering heat of the desert. And it was just like the kid said, there were children everywhere. I'd just never noticed them before. Small kids and older kids, hanging out in ones and twos and in much larger groups, scampering around and playing tag and racing each other up and down the escalators, or squatting in display windows and making ridiculous faces at the adults passing by. And there were others, sallow-faced kids, lurking in the alleys between shops, and they were all staring at me. And they were smiling. I smiled back, but I was a little spooked. I couldn't figure out where all these kids had come from. I'd never noticed them before, and they weren't with their parents. At least, not as far as I could see. But they looked like regular kids. Not like they'd run away from home or something. Ah, more kids live the best life, the kid told me. They get all the best stuff. No parents to worry about. Stay up as late as they like. Watch all the grown-up movies. It's like your birthday every day. I was pretty impressed when I heard this. I thought it would be a mighty fine thing if I became a mall kid as well. So, I went ahead and asked. How do you become a mall kid? In the hope that becoming a mall kid was easy and didn't require any exams. Oh, you have to lose your parents, said the kid matter-of-factly. You hide until your parents stop looking for you, and after that you can come out to play every day. It's as simple as that, really. But where can I hide? Oh, the mall mommy will help you hide. She looks after all the kids. She's very nice. She gives us presents and makes up games to play, and she throws us birthday parties all the time. She's not like a mommy at all. She's more like your best friend ever. I was intrigued. Where does she live? I asked. Oh, I'll show you, the kid said. She's not that far away. She'll probably give you a present. She loves meeting new kids. I was pleased to hear this. I hurried to keep up with the kid, still staring at the children around me, wondering how I could possibly have missed them all. This time... There were so many of them. The younger ones chasing around and playing tag and jumping on each other. The older ones talking to each other in muted tones, staring at me and smiling. What's your name? I asked the kid. Dave, said the kid. I'm seven. How old are you? Six, I said. You're quite big for six, said Dave. I thought you were seven or eight at least. I realized now he was just trying to flatter me, but at the time I believed Dave, and I swelled a little with pride, thinking I could easily pass for eight, that I was old enough to be a mall kid. I didn't need mom telling me what ties I could or couldn't have. We were heading across the third level concourse, past the food stands and the promotional booths, and there were crowds everywhere, queuing up for special offers and free product samples and there were people sitting in al fresco restaurants, families and couples, and the odd loner, and even sitting still eating. They all looked like they were in a hurry, like they wanted nothing better than to hurl themselves back into the fray, to get that last must-have item before someone else got to it first. But, strangely enough, the more kids seemed to exist in their own reality. None of the grown-ups paid them any attention, even when they were racing in and out amongst them. Nobody seemed bothered that there were loads of kids everywhere, and no adult to keep them under control. No one even seemed to notice them, and the kids, laughing and hooting, swept around the grown-ups and flowed between them in a way I can't quite describe. The way a river flows between rocks, the way air flows through the tangled branches of a forest, and even today... 
I struggle to exactly describe these phenomena. The children didn't collide with the shoppers. They simply bent around them, not physically, not tangibly, but in a way that baffled the senses. It was as though reality itself was bending and warping, as though the shoppers were printed on one strip of film and the mall kids printed on another. And although the two strips were running alongside each other, they weren't actually interacting. We were moving up the escalator to the fourth floor. There were more kids staring at me as they rode down the escalator. Some of them waved and smiled, prompting me to wave back. I felt good. I felt like the other kids had already accepted me as one of their own. And to an only child, that was immensely important. I was going to be a more kid. I was going to have birthday parties every day. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a fine thing? I may have felt twinges of doubt as I moved even further away from my mother, but I no longer remember. It was so long ago, and sometimes I recall things one way, and sometimes I recall them another, but I do remember that kid, Dave, talking all the way, telling me how great life was as a moor kid, how there were no school lessons or tests or boring homework, and how you could watch the TV through the shop windows, because they were always on and they displayed all the channels. Hundreds, maybe even thousands of channels, including 24-hour cartoon channels. I watched as a couple of mall kids slid down the handrails on the opposite escalator, laughing and shrieking as they went. And I was amazed how everyone ignored them. Usually grown-ups got really mad when kids fooled around like that. But these kids seemed to do whatever they wanted. I was excited. I wanted to join in. I wanted to slide all the way from the top of the escalator to the bottom. Or ride the mall train for free. Or steal those cupcakes with icing that they sold on the first level. The world was filled with sudden and unexpected possibilities. Oh, to be a mall kid, I thought, must be the best thing in the world. Way better than working in a candy shop or even a toy shop. Because when you were a mall kid, you didn't have to work at all and you got all your candy and toys for free. We changed escalators, and now we were heading up towards the fifth floor, the highest level in the mall. And that's when I started having some serious doubts. Hey, I said. Where are we going? To see the mall, Mommy, said Dave, as though it was no big thing. Hey, you should see this place around Christmas. He declared. Santa Claus is here, and there are so many presents you can't even open them all before next Christmas comes around. Where's the mall, Mommy? I asked. Dave shrugged. Oh, in the cinema, he said. She's waiting for you. She's really excited to see you, Jerry. But the euphoria was wearing off. She's got a transformer to be replaced by a deep, one of the lagging fear. I didn't want to go to the cinema. Not for any number of Transformer toys. And I told Dave this. I told him I wasn't going to the cinema because my mummy would get angry. But he just laughed and said I was being silly. That the mall mummy would be my new mummy. That she was the best mummy a kid could ever have. I said that may be so, but I still wanted to go back to my real mummy. Because she was going to be mad at me if I went up to the cinema on my own. But you're not on your own, Jeremy. Dave said, You're with me. He gave me a disappointed look. Don't you want to be a mall kid? Sure I do, I said. But even as I said this, I was peering up the escalator with little wings of dread fluttering around my heart. It could have been my imagination, but it seemed the higher we travelled, the dimmer the light was getting, and a deep chill was creeping into the air. I turned and peered down the escalator, and I was startled to see dozens of more kids standing on the escalator below me, blocking my escape route and smiling up at me. You'll see, Dave was saying. The mall mommy looks after all of the kids that get lost in the mall. I'm not lost, I insisted. Dave glared down at me, and I noticed his eyes were glowing bright as sun-dazzled pennies. Yes, you are, he said. You're like us, Jeremy. 
You don't have parents anymore. They searched for you for days, but they couldn't find you, so they gave up. They had a new child. They moved on. Now you're a lost kid. A dead kid. A forgotten kid. And only the mall mommy loves you. You're lying, I shouted. I know where my mommy is, and she's going to come look for me if I don't get back real soon. I turned to start down the escalator, but Dave reached out and grabbed me by the arm. His fingers were cold and sharp, and they pierced my skin like little shards of glass. Come and meet the mall mommy, he said, and his voice had changed. It sounded syrupy and thick, and not at all like the voice of a little boy. And turning, I was horrified to see Dave's features shimmering and melting, allowing me to glimpse for a moment something dark and rotten hiding beneath the skin. Let me go, I cried. He tightened his grip. The more mommy has so many gifts to give you, he hissed. She's the only mommy you'll ever need, Jeremy. She's not my mommy, I screamed as I struggled with him. I don't want to meet her. Let me go. But the kids behind me were whispering. She wants to meet you, Jeremy. She's such a good mommy. She's the best mommy. The best mommy. Dave was dragging me the rest of the way up the escalator. The very best mommy a boy could ever have. And staring past him, I saw the top of the escalator was swimming in darkness. So gloomy I could barely see the cinema or the fast food restaurant. But I could sense something waiting for me up there. It gave off waves of malice and corruption. A sense of slow, crawling evil that sucked the light and warmth out of the air. I moaned in terror. I felt sluggish and disconnected, the way I felt when I was caught in the treacle-thick folds of a nightmare. The entire mall was concentrated into a capstone of darkness that swelled and billowed above me. The lights of the cinema still glowing through the gloom, the burger restaurant displaying its brand colours, yellow and blue, in broad, fluorescent strips. But everything else was lost in those pungent, cloying shadows. Please, let me go, I sobbed. Please. We'd reached the top of the escalator by this time, and Dave was hauling me towards the yawning mouth of the cinema, and I was fighting and screaming for him to let me go. But the whole place was deserted. There weren't any grown-ups here, and the other mall kids were crowding behind me, whispering, She loves you so much, Jeremy. She wants to play with you. She wants to play with you forever. Oh, dear God. Even today I struggle with the memory of it. That soupy feeling of absolute horror. The air is grainy as a black and white picture drained of all life and vitality, and the gloom giving way to an abysmal darkness that yawned through the open doors of the cinema. A darkness so complete, it can only be found at the back of a child's closet, or under his bed, and, out of that darkness, the most dreadful voice issued, the most syrupy, cloying imitation of a mother's voice, and even to my untutored ears, it was a grotesque travesty. Come to me, Jeremy. The voice oozed around me like warm waves of licorice. I've watched you for so long, dear child. Sitting and eating with your mother. Never coming to visit. And I've longed for you to come and visit me. I have such gifts to give you. Such joys to behold. Such movies to watch back here in the dark. Come sweet boy. Don't fight. Don't struggle. Mommy will take care of everything. But I did struggle. And I did fight. And I bit to and spat and screamed myself blue. But Dave was way stronger than me. And the cinema kept creeping closer. Its doors cracked open like the sideways smile of a dead man. The darkness festering beyond it, 
infinitely dark. There would be no returning to the light once I was dragged into that. No memory of the light. Nothing. Just the feel of the more mummy's fingers creeping over my flesh. And her voice crooning to me on waves of putrid breath. That's it, Jeremy. Just a little closer. And then all your worries will be behind you. Oh, dear, dear child. How I've longed to hold you in my arms. The thought of that monstrosity holding me in her arms proved too much for me. I reached up in the extremes of my terror and jabbed my finger into Dave's left eye as hard as I could. He shrieked in pain and reeled away from me, his hands clutching his face. And suddenly, I was free. Instantly, I turned and raced towards the down escalator. Unnerved by the shrieks of their leader, the other mall kids flinched away from me as I belted past, and for an instant I saw they were no longer fresh-faced kids. Their skin had become green and patchy, like rotting fish. Their eyes were milky and grey, and their lips had been eaten away by corruption to reveal yellowing teeth and gaping sockets. I barely had time to register this transformation. I was barreling down the escalator as fast as my short legs could carry me. But too slow. Too slow. Behind me, the mall mummy was screaming with rage, and her voice was dreadful to hear. Come back here, you brat. Don't you dare make me come after you. I swear you'll regret it if I do. I half turned to see the mall kids scurrying down the escalator after me like a swarm of rats. And this sight so frightened me, I scrambled up on the handrail of the escalator, straddling it and holding on tight for a moment, before letting go, and down I slid. Faster than I expected, my head filled with noise and confusion, and the echoing screams of the mall mummy. You're for it. <clears throat> oh, you're for it now, she shrieked. You've done it now, you little bastard. I'm coming for you now, I am, and I swear I won't be sparing the rod. I reached the bottom of the escalator and glanced up. The mall kids were sliding down the hound rails after me. I knew I'd only gained a tiny head start. So I turned and slid all the way down the second escalator, and when I reached the third level of the mall, I tore across the concourse as though the hounds of hell were after me, and I shrieked and howled, and you'd have expected everyone to pay attention to a little kid shrieking and howling in the middle of a shopping mall, but no one paid the slightest bit of attention to me. Maybe they were blind to me. Maybe I'd somehow slipped into the mall kid's half-world, and that's why no one could see me. I like to think that was the reason people ignored me that day. That they couldn't physically see me. That I was somehow invisible to them. Because the other explanation, the more rational explanation, scares me even worse. That no one cared. That everyone was too busy going after that must-have last-minute bargain to spare a thought for some little kid in distress. The more kids were pursuing me through the crowds, and I changed direction as I ran, but they appeared ahead of me and all around, leering at me from between gaps in the adult herd. And they looked like corpses now, like little, dead corpses, bloated and rotting, with eyes sunk deep in their skulls. Come back, you little bastard, they hissed. Come back with us at once. You've made Mummy angry. Oh, you're in so much trouble. You might as well come back now. You're only making things worse for yourself. At last, I saw a mall cop. A tall, thin black man in a peaked cap. Smiling at people left and right as he sauntered towards me. I ran straight up to him, howling and wailing and clutching at his sleeve. And to my immense relief, he crouched down and asked me what was wrong. Had I lost my mummy or something? <laughs> no worries. He could send out an announcement, and she'd know where I was. And I remember the sound of his voice. So calm and soothing. 
I even remember the smell of his cologne. I remember it more clearly than my father's, because I had been invisible. I had been dead, and it was like the mole cop had reached down into my death-like state and snatched me out of it. It's okay, little guy, he said as he started speaking into his walkie-talkie. We're fetching your mommy now. But I wouldn't let go of his arm. I clung to it, still sobbing and wailing and peering around me. And to my immense relief, I saw the more kids were fading away. I could still see them, but they had become indistinct. Like shadows now. Silhouettes creeping around. And then, after a time, I couldn't see them at all. <laughs> Here you go, said the mole cop. Here's your mom now. I turned to see mom heading towards us. I was about to rush to her, but the mole cop suddenly gripped my shoulder and held me in check. Hold on, kid, he said. I've just got to have a few words with your mommy. Mom came up to us. She looked furious. She was glaring at me like she wouldn't mind throttling me there and then. And her mood only got worse when the mall cop started lecturing her on the dangers of letting a kid my age out of her sight. The mall cop looked old enough to be my mum's dad. And he had a paternal way about him that stopped mom in her tracks. She stared resentfully at him. But she listened quietly and I could see her hands clenching and unclenching and her jawline tightening, like she was forcing herself not to retort. I stared down at Mum's hands. I watched them, clenching and unclenching. She was wearing yellow nail varnish. I frowned. I'd never known Mum to wear yellow nail varnish before. Last time I'd seen her, she'd been wearing blue nail varnish. I tugged at the mall cop's arm, but he kept on talking. I tugged harder. Excuse me, I said. He glanced down at me. That's not my mom, I said. Why was that? The mall cop blinked at me. She's not my mom, I said again. Ah, oh, for goodness sake, mom snapped. I've had enough of this. She reached out to take me by the arm. Come on, Jeremy. Your dad's waiting for you. The mall cop stepped between us. Hang on, he said. Can I see some ID, ma'am? Mom glared at him. Are you kidding? She snapped. I'm his mom. His name's Jeremy. That ought to be enough for you. He says you're not his mom, the mall cop said. So... You know, I'm really going to need to see some ID, ma'am. Oh, he's messing around, Mom exploded. Of course I'm his mom. She tried to get around the mall cop, but he moved to block him. He doesn't look like he's messing around, ma'am, he said. The kid looks scared. Are you going to let me take my son, or am I going to have to call the police? Yeah, you know what? I think we should call the police, ma'am. I think that's exactly what we need to do. He raised his walkie-talkie to his lips, but mum was already beating a retreat. She glared at the moor cop with rage and hatred in her eyes. She actually snarled at him like a dog, but she was moving backwards, melting into the crowd. And just out of spite, just before she disappeared, the more mommy turned to me and showed me her true face. I'll never forget the nightmare she revealed to me. I wet my bed for three years after that. Mom's features melted and gave way to reveal a face that was cavernous ruin. The eyes swimming in sockets filled with writhing, squirming roaches that suddenly erupted forth and scuttled across the mall mummy's face like living scar tissue. And she had no lower jaw. Her whole face ended with a top row of teeth protruding out of her face like the fangs of a wolf. She glared at me, 
and I still can't get that look of utter hatred out of my head. It's haunted me since childhood. I'm coming for you, she whispered in my ear. After your mummy tucks you up in bed at night. After she's switched off the light. After she's closed the door. Oh, Jeremy. That's when I'll come creeping out from beneath your bed. You'll hear me. You'll hear me calling your name. Right before I rip the beating heart out of your chest. And then, she was gone. My real mum found me not long afterwards, and I ran straight into her arms and I wouldn't let go. The moor cop didn't give mum a lecture like he had the moor mummy. I think he was a little troubled by the whole incident. He kept glancing in the direction the moor mummy had vanished in, like he was trying to work something out. And that was the last time I ever set foot in a moor. Mum didn't push me on the issue. She knew something had happened that day, but it took years before she could prize even part of the story from me. But, you know what? Every time I hear some kid is missing, I get to wondering whether that kid is a runaway, or whether something reached out and snatched him into the darkness that swells and congeals just beyond the rim of everyday perception. The darkness that every kid knows about, that gathers thickest at the back of the closet, and under the bed, and hides the face of every conceivable nightmare. And sometimes, when you least expect it, those nightmares come true. How good was that? Did you enjoy that one? That's the third story by Chica de Luna that I've done in pretty quick succession over the past few weeks. And I want you know what I want you to do, don't you? <laughs> do me that little favor. Head over to his website. Um, I've left the URL in the video description. Sign up and you are going to get a fantastic free copy of his book, Black Eyes. Go on, head over there now. Stop listening. Go on. <laughs> well, my dear friends. I will be back with you again on Monday. Not quite sure what with yet, but you know I'll be here waiting for you all. Okay? Have a great weekend, and I'll see you all again. Bright-eyed and bushy child on Monday. <laughs>